and welcome to the final webinar in this series of Space AM webinars brought to you by Fluency Marketing. Now, my name is Sarah Crudis. It's my pleasure to be your host for this lunchtime. Now, the space industry in the UK has the potential to provide a vital boost to the economy, with growing opportunities for space manufacturing from government investments. And today we're talking specifically about the future of space in the UK, hearing from Space for Cornwall, London Economics and the National Composite Centre. These webinars have been a teaser for what you can expect at our face-to-face, -face, yes, you heard that right, face-to-face -face Space AM conference, which I will be sharing, which will be taking place from the 14th to the 15th of September at Leicester Racecourse. Now, there are plenty of opportunities to get involved, so please contact the Fluency Marketing team, and details on how you're able to do that should be in the chat box right now. So the aim of this webinar and conference is to answer some of the questions being asked of the supply chain and how material innovations will help to accelerate the space technology as we enter into this new commercial space sector. And before we start, just a reminder, you'll receive a link to the recording of the whole discussion via email shortly after the webinar, which you can watch back as often as you like, as well as sharing freely with anyone who you think might be interested in it. So before we go on to our first speaker, let's welcome to the stage Dave Pollard, who's the Education and Outreach Manager at Space Cornwall, Nick Oswald, Satellite and Space Sector Specialist at London Economics, and a double act, yes, it's the first for our Space AM webinars, a double act from the National Composite Centre, Stuart Donovan Holmes, Head of Defence and Space, and Sean, Sean Cooper, Chief Engineer, Defence and Space. So our speakers will be very happy to take your questions during this webinar. Just put your questions in the chat box and if they can't answer during the webinar, we'll endeavour to get them answered afterwards. So if I could ask Nick, Sean and Stuart to leave the stage and Dave Pollard, if I can kindly invite you to begin your presentation. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the introduction. I'll just wait for my uh, presentation to load up. Okay, so um, my name is Dave Pollard and I'm the Education Outreach Manager at Spaceport Cornwall. Um, at Spaceport Cornwall, our motto is launch our future. And for those of you that don't know, um, Spaceport Cornwall are planning to be the, the first ever launch location um, for the UK to space working with Virgin Orbit. I've got a very short video to show you now. Um, why this is important after the, the video. Team Rocket, RDM Rocket Net, looking for confirmation your system is still go. Thermal. Thermal is go. AVI. AVI. Go. Yeah. Flight software. Flight software is go. GNC. GNC is go. GNC's go. GNC's Payload. Payload. Let's go. 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 let us Okay. LDC on control room, we are go for terminal count. Release. Release, release, release. Release confirmed. New three startup confirmed. Stage one burn nominal. S band lock for Baja TM data is confirmed. Mexico Alpha achieved. Stage 1 trajectory nominal. Music to my ears. Thank you. Element roll over base. Uh, stage 1 burn is nominal, passing 120,000 feet. Newton 3 shutdown confirmed. Stage 7 brake fire is broken. Stage 4 startup complete. S2 prop. Stage 2 burn is nominal. Downrange, O'Higgins, locked. AOS and frame lock at Mauritius. LD on control room, for those who haven't heard, we have a confirmation of all seven satellites deployed. All systems are good, they're kind of back to land. Copy stepping up, it was a great day to go to space with everybody. LD, LSU, Cosmic Girl is on the ground. Welcome back, Cosmic Girl.
David, sorry to interrupt. I think so your microphone. Was... Got it. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so that was Virgin Orbit's uh, second successful flight, which took uh, part last month. Um, and their first successful flight was in January this year. Um, that's been about a decade in the making um, from sort of initial concept to development of the Cosmic Go and Launcher One. Um, and that is also the exact same technology that they'll be bringing to Spaceport Cornwall next year to be the first ever launch from UK soil. Um, so Spaceport Cornwall is going to be based at Cornwall Airport Newquay. And Cornwall Airport Newquay was chosen because it's got one of the longest runways in the UK. It's got a largely uncongested airspace above. It's a fairly rural area and it's got almost direct access over the sea. So about seven years ago, uh, they tentatively put their hand up uh, to become one of the UK spaceports um, and they were selected for, for those reasons. And this is what we're going to get to see um, next year uh, in 2022, probably uh, around the middle of next year. Um, and you know everybody's super excited about that and the developments that are going to come off of the back of that. Um, some of those developments are um, we've recently um, secured funding and started a build on a centre for space technologies um, and also a satellite integration facility. And the centre for space technologies is going to be for SMEs and for academia um, to have a sort of space there to, to set up. And we're already oversubscribed with people that are interested in taking space in, in, in that centre. And the, um, the satellite integration facility is going to essentially be a huge clean room, um, a hangar sized clean room uh, for, for putting satellites into the rocket. Um, and then when Virgin Orbit aren't using it, we want to be working with academia to be using that space for sort of scientific research um, and so that we keep people in it all year round. Um, so this is this uh, Centre for Space Technologies is being developed um, and we're anticipating that we're, um, Space Walk Cornwall will create 150 immediate jobs over the sort of short, short term period um, with uh, over 50 companies currently engaged uh, in space in Cornwall. I've got a map of some of those companies coming up on, on the next slide. Um, and we're also anticipating a further sort of 250 jobs in the supply chain and being created through through the demand and also through the sort of cluster that is developing down here. So what is the opportunity for Cornwall? Um, so in Cornwall, we are developing a cluster. We've got a runway and a spaceport with Spaceport Cornwall and Cornwall Airport Newquay. Um, we've got an aircraft and a rocket um, through Virgin Orbit. We've already got world-class mission control facilities with Goon Hilly Earth Station, who are also recently uh, involved with some of the Mars communication, the Mars Lunar communication. And we've got the satellite applications catapult, which is there to help businesses set up in, in this area. Um, and I mentioned that we've got about 50 companies, more than 50 companies now, um, sort of working um, within the space sector in the county. Um, and, and these can be these can be um, companies that wouldn't necessarily be associated with space. And so, so some of the mining companies are starting to use space related data to help identify the, the future mine sites for, for things like Cornish Lithium. Um, but it can also be um, sort of organisations that are doing manufacturing. So organisations like Teagle, who, who, who create some of the, the parts that we need uh, in regards to defence and, and satellites. Um, you may have also seen in the news recently that we've also signed a memorandum of understanding with um, a, a US company, Sierra Space. Um, and, and that is for their um, rocket, which is a, it's a vertical launcher, but it's a horizontal lander. Um, and that's for that to land with us um, in the future. And I think that's probably sort of three to five years off um, being done, but that, that's hugely exciting to have our sort of second partner in place already. Um, so the UK government has targeted uh, the UK with capturing 10% of the global 400 billion pound space economy. And we currently manufacture a lot of the world's satellite, well, 10 to 20% of the world's satellites in the UK, but we have no launch site. And we're hoping that by providing this in Cornwall, There'll be other companies that want to be that want to be located close to the launch site um, and set up and, and help um, sort of develop the cluster even further down here. One thing that's super important to me, being the outreach and education manager, is the opportunity to inspire a generation of young people. So in the US during the Apollo missions, they saw a huge um, spike in students studying STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, and maths, right up to PhD level. Um, we've got quite a comprehensive outreach program um, and we're hoping that we'll have a similar effect on sort of the local and the national population because I think from now through to next year with the first launch there's going to be a growing increase of media coverage 
um, and, and a lot of engagement sort of nationally around that first ever UK launch. And we're really hoping that that will help inspire the next generation of sort of engineers and data scientists um, to, to, to look at that. And I see, I see space as a great hook into STEM, whether or not they go on to study a space related subject or not. Um, but I think it's a great hook. And some of the things that we've got coming up at the moment is we've got an exhibition running um, over the summer holidays um, called A Story of a Satellite, and that's got the uh, Launcher One model. We've also got model satellites, a uh, VR headset experience, and we're inviting as many sort of young people, but also older people to come as possible to experience that and, and sort of see space firsthand. And the feedback from that has been, has been great so far. Um, you may have also seen a couple of weeks ago um, that the UK space flight regulations have passed, and that was one of the sort of ne next big big blocks to actually being able to, to launch next year. So that's fantastic that that's gone through. And um, we've also, you may have seen in the news that, um, around the G7, uh, we announced that we are we will be de developing a Kernosat one. Um, so a Cornwall community satellite that will be going up on the first launch and that will be looking at some environmental um, issues around Cornwall to, su to support Cornwall but then also be able to be rolled out across the country and, and possibly around the world. Um, so initially that's probably going to be looking at um, sea conditions and whether it would be relevant to be able to develop a kelp forest in Cornwall um, because kelp is, is a huge carbon sink um, and if we're if the council are able to develop a kelp forest, then that will help mitigate and offset some of the um, sort of climate challenges that we have as a county. That's a very quick sort of whistle stop tour to who we are and what we're planning to do. Um, I think hopefully you'll hear more about us over the over the next year as we get closer to that first launch. Um, but I would welcome any questions that you have. Thank you so much for that, Dave. Um, if anyone's got any questions, if you can actually put them in the chat box and I can answer them directly to Dave. He's around until half past one. Um, and if not, he will um, hopefully um, answer those afterwards. But I, I just took a quick question. And you you talk about the potential uh, and this whole idea of almost like a new space ecosystem, which could come with the UK having its own space. But we've been a you know, huge success in, March, uh, in manufacturing small satellites. What is the potential of, of growth once we have an operating spaceport in the UK and we're already manufacturing so many satellites here? How can we see the space industry develop and what is the potential for disruption within the UK? Yeah, I think there's huge opportunity really in the fact that currently we send all of our satellites overseas to launch. Um, and if we can have the launch here and the satellite manufacturers here. Um, next, we need is that increased demand on um, small satellites um, uh, and their uses and I think as more and more sort of businesses are understanding how small satellites can be used to benefit them um, then that demand is increasing and we'll, and we'll see that sort of grow exponentially over the next sort of five to ten years um, and that will be kind of where the business will come from for the future launches. And a lot of people, when they, they think of space, they're outside of the industry, they think about it being something which almost doesn't relate to them. But what we're seeing now, I like to use the analogy, is comparable with the internet in the 1990s, in the sense that the, the greatest companies that will exist in, in 30 years, for example, we probably haven't heard of them in the same way we hadn't heard of Amazon, Facebook, Google in the 1990s. How much of a cost reduction for getting payloads to space could we see by having a launch site here in the UK and the satellites being manufactured here? So, like the cost reduction has predominantly come from the um, reduction in the size of the technology. Um, so, uh, I, d I don't know the answer to the question in how much compared to sending it abroad to how much it is here, because I don't know how much um, the, the cost is to, to send it up in space with Virgin Orbit at present. But I think the costs have come down so greatly over the past decades because the technology is getting smaller. So that means that you're able to, to launch multiple payloads on the same rocket um, and those satellites, those smaller satellites can perform as well as some of the larger satellites that have been put up into orbit. Okay, and we've got a question from Neelam and this question is, what are other barriers to growth in the space sector that the UK government might address? It's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, one that might demand a fair bit of thinking about. Um, I think some of the barriers uh, involved are from an educational perspective um, that having the right skill set. I think there was a, a skill survey out recently um, and it highlighted that, that we still struggle with a slight shortage in some of those really relevant high-tech skills um, and 
we need to get the education system right um, and the courses at the colleges and the universities to make sure that we've got a, a supply chain of young people coming through to help fill those gaps in the future. Um, in regards to other sort of barriers that the, the, the space sector, I, I think there's always a challenge around um, funding and the right levels of funding to, to help the sector really flourish um, and that's going to be something that hopefully the, the UK government will commit to over, over time. Um, to actually having some of their own um, sort of satellites um, launched from the UK. And I, I would just, if, if you don't mind me, uh, David, um, I, I would just add to that as well. Um, risk, uh, particularly with um, entrepreneurial ventures, um, certainly within the UK and Europe, if you fail uh, as a company, that's often seen as a negative thing. Whereas in the US, you see a way of embracing failure. It's just a, a way that didn't work and you go on and try again. And I think one of the the key areas the UK government needs to help um, cultivate or nurture is this, this ability to embrace risk and to embrace failure and not see it as a failure if a business fails, but actually a step towards success. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, if you look at Virgin Orbits, the Virgin Orbits first test flight was uh, didn't work. They had a blocked fuel line um, and they celebrated that entirely because they learned so much from that first test launch, whereas I think here it, it may not have been taken quite the same way. Okay, we've got quite a few questions for you, so um, I'll ask one more, and then if you're kind enough to um, answer some of the questions in the chat box afterwards, that'd be great. Um, I'm just going to do them in the order that they came in. So Bilal asked, um, do you anticipate Cornwall Spaceport to be a self-contained community? No, not a self-contained community. I think um, I do bumble on a lot about the cluster um, being developed here, but um, it, it wouldn't be self-contained. We would need um, skills and products and, uh, and parts from all over the UK and all over the world. Um, but I think just from my perspective as a, as a Cornishman sort of growing up, there weren't those um, sort of high skilled, high tech, high paid um, jobs down here um, as, as much. And I think if we can get the sector, uh, get the cluster right, then, it, then there are huge opportunities to develop that in the future and for young people to be able to stay here. And, and, and do you think, because um, it quite resonated when you said that you were a Cornishman growing up and there wasn't that opportunity, it was the same for me growing up in the UK, but the, the lack of a, a space industry, so to think, you, you just assumed it would be in America. Do you think um, Spaceport Cornwall will enable more young people to realise that the UK has a space sector, they can be part of the space sector in the UK, they don't, we don't need to lose that talent abroad and, and that will help continue to nurture this, this great space sector and the great potential that we've got here? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think um, that, you know, we are one spaceport in the UK. There's there's seven sites in total. Um, Shetland are, are also very sort of on a par with us. And I think between us um, and, and the organisations that we're working with, um, then it really there is a real growing knowledge about the UK space sector. But one thing that I always try and get across to to young people is that the upstream is one area that is quite well known within within space, you know, building rockets, putting rockets into space. The other huge area of opportunity is that downstream use of satellite data. Um, you know, if we are launching more and more satellites, we're also getting more and more data back and we need to be able to use that data in, in a really beneficial way for, for humanity. But there's also huge opportunities commercially to develop new products, new services. Um, and that's the other area that I see massive amount of opportunity. So going to space, it isn't just as much about exploring, but it's actually looking back at Earth and, and using that that new way of looking back at Earth to improve life on Earth and, and to generate a new economy, an off world economy. Yeah, totally. Okay, well, um, I'm going to leave it there because we're out of time, but you've got quite a lot of questions, um, Dave. I know you're with us only for another 10 minutes, but if you're able to answer the questions in the chat box, that would be fantastic. So, um, Dave Pollard from Spaceport Cornwall, thank you very much. And if I could kindly welcome to the stage now, Nick Oswald, Satellite and Space Effect. Hello? Hello? Can
can you hear me? We seem to Sorry. have lost Sarah. <laughs> seem to have lost Sarah. So if you oh, want to go no. ahead with your presentation. Uh, yeah, I'm slightly worried the gremlins were kicking in there. Um, I, I'm back. I, I, the technology. I, I apologise, <laughs> Nick. I can hear you, but I don't think anyone else can hear me. Oh, well, this is a good case for why we need uh, more satellite broadband. I think it <laughs> really is. Thank you for that excellent segue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, um, so uh, I'm Nick Oswald. Uh, I am here today to uh, give you uh, a, an overview of the, the opportunities uh, across the UK space sector in the next, next few years. Um, I work as an economic consultant uh, at London Economics as part of a dedicated, a small team dedicated to servicing the the needs of the space industry who, who um, are uh, quantifying some of the benefits, uh, tangible and intangible, uh, of, of various space programs. Uh, we actually have actually uh, a number of different uh, specialists in other sectors, uh, such as competition economists, uh, behavioural scientists uh, and, and consumer rights specialists that, that form uh, part of the, the wider remit of London economics. So, uh, as mentioned, uh, the presentation I, I'm looking forward to giving you today uh, is just to touch upon some of the potential opportunities uh, occurring across the, the space supply chain. Uh, I'm just going to have a look at um, what what we consider as, as being part of the, the umbrella that comes under space activities. Uh, and also just having a look at a few facts and figures to, to suss out the, the value of the opportunity for participants. And, and look at the ways that, that particularly new entrants can, can get involved in the space sector. Uh, so first of all, uh, we tend to segment the, um, hoping the connection isn't too problematic. Um, so first of all, uh, the one that, that most people are familiar with, uh, the upstream sector, which is focused on manufacturing of uh, satellites and components and subsystems that go into satellites and space rockets. Uh, and these are then integrated into the, the final vehicle, uh, which is yeah, typically a, a satellite or, or rocket. Um, within uh, the, next, the next phase is the midstream, which is concerned with space operations. And uh, this is primarily activities such as launch services. It can also be in terms of uh, management funding with them, uh, down, down linking any data from the spacecraft, or alternatively just maintaining the health of the spacecraft in case it gets into any difficulties and various maintenance. Um, and then lastly, the, the downstream, which is uh, where a lot of the, the focus of London economics uh, uh, resides. Um, this looks at um, users particularly looking to use signals from space such as GNSS which is uh, global navigational satellite systems uh, which is you probably be more familiar with GPS the, the US version of that. Uh, also earth observation data and also satellite communications uh, and we spend a lot of time uh, particularly in, in GNSS and, and earth observation um, assessing uh, the impact that, that space makes uh, for uh, users in the downstream and people who, who provide services derived from space signals. And then underpinning that uh, is something we, we class as ancillary services, uh, which is activities that, that support the, the space industry. London Economics uh, being a, a prime example of that. Uh, also covers things such as um, launch services procurement and insurance. So just to get a bit of an overview uh, on, on the size of the opportunity at hand, um, first of all we consider the, the global space sector, um, looking at the, the figures from a, a pre-COVID world, uh, uh, not getting too distorted. Um, the estimates vary but we're talking uh, in the region of around 300 billion pounds globally. Um, the UK, uh, as mentioned by, by Dave in the last presentation, is targeting a 
share of that that market of 10% by the end of the decade. Uh, at the moment, we estimate the UK, um, it, the global sector is about 17 times that of the UK. So there's, there's still some way to go. Uh, also, the space operations tends to take up, we estimate takes up around two thirds of the activities that take place in the UK. Um, so in terms of some of the, the changes that we've seen in the space market, or generally over the last few years, um, there's a, a phenomenon which has been uh, given that the moniker of new space, which just the most, the straightforward way to think of this is um, it's in terms of the participants who are now who are able to pa um, participate within the marketplace. Previously, uh, historically, this has always been um, uh, entities such as governments, uh, military organizations, space industry and, and, and large industry, which has been able to overcome some of the barriers to entry to, to space activities in terms of the cost. Um, whereas in recent times, more commercial enterprises have to, to emerge in the sector, um, offering a different dynamic. Um, so where some of the classical um, space activities would focus on gradual improvements to, to space technology, the, the old, adage, old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, the, new, the new way that have come in have, have looked to spin in new technology from other sector, sectors and generally disrupt the marketplace and, and look to miniaturize components, which are all the way up to, to satellites, which have which can be miniaturized uh, in, in new and innovative ways. Um, this also relates to the supply chain itself, um, whereas previously uh, most space, space manufacturers would look to use heavily tested uh, radiation hardened components. Um, the new wave has have come in and said, we're going to take off the shelf equipment, which is readily available and uh, uh, a competitive price and we're going to effectively test this hardware on the spacecraft as we fly it and the difference here being that the intended duration that the satellites will stay in orbit is considerably lower than the classical methodology uh, so if there is an issue with a, a satellite it's it's a rapid replacement cycle and that's that's produced that's leading to a high volume and a high turnover and, and big demand on supply chains for the space industry Um, so just to touch on some of the what the what we, the main trends uh, impacting on on UK space at the moment. Um, first of all, as as touched upon in the previous slide, um, it's it's a new en new entrance into the market who are looking to to do new and different and exciting things um, within the UK and and elsewhere. Um, the first of those relates to this the concept of satellite mega constellations. Um, historically, the whole of humanity, till around about a couple of years ago, had launched of the order of a few thousand uh, objects into space. Over the next 10 years, a varied market forecast suggests this is going to be a step change into the tens of thousands. And that's because it's, it's not an entirely new concept, but there's been a revival of interest in rather than having one very large expensive satellite, which can cover uh, a fixed uh, area on the ground or footprint. Instead, the opportunity to launch multiple smaller satellite into low Earth orbit, which provides many benefits in terms of being able to provide global coverage. And also if one of the elements of the system has an issue, then if you have um, several others already in space that can, or in orbit that can replace part of the system that's not working, it's, it's a great benefit to uh, operators and to users. Um, we've already had uh, an excellent presentation from, from Dave on, on UK launch, uh, a little bit more on that in a moment. Um, the next main trend is trying to harness some of the excellence that the UK has demonstrated historically in terms of technology development. Uh, there's a great demand to squeeze more out of the resources available on, on existing satellites, uh, looking to digitize um, some of the payloads, and also miniaturization of some of the craft. Um, an important aspect of this as well is also considering the, the end goal uh, for users on the ground and 
as the space hardware is changing, that means the requirement for the, the users and the ground terminals is also changing. And there's going to be some, some a great demand for that in, in years to come. And also lastly, just touching on the idea of with more non-specialists in the marketplace, uh, the idea of companies offering space or satellite as a service. So you can go to a provider and say, uh, I want to put this into for example, into space, but I don't want to build a satellite. Can you do this for me? Uh, and then the last of the main trends uh, relates to resilience and security, which is a uh, push from the UK government uh, to just build up more domestic space capabilities within the UK. Um, so, yes, excellent presentation from Dave already. Uh, just to highlight, um, there's in fact seven different sites under consideration for uh, regulatory, regulatory approval for space launch activities, uh, which is going to put great demands across the, the full spectrum of the value chain within the UK. Um, also, uh, another big development is with the OneWeb constellation, which the UK government uh, purchased a stake in uh, over the last couple of years. Um, this is a constellation of several hundred um, small sats in lower and low Earth orbit, intended to pro provide um, global broad, uh, broadband capabilities um, to users in, in various different sectors. Um, then just examining the technology development a little further. Um, a small sat is essentially anything that, that weighs as a mass of less than half a ton. So previously, uh, big satellites could be anything up to five or six tons. Um, these are predominantly used in low Earth orbit, but also can be used in, in other in higher altitude orbits as well. Um, and this is ideal for, for where you need to cover a lot of uh, ground track. Potentially, if you're doing an application such as Earth observation or the monitoring, um, or for indeed for some of these mega constellations, uh, using them for satellite communications purposes. Uh, so the actual demands upon the supply chain and, and there's, there's several uh, organisations emerging in the UK, UK looking to manufacture uh, spacecraft here in the UK is is quite a exciting opportunity. Um, as mentioned, with some of these satellite communication services in particular, um, there'll be a need for new uh, user terminals. Um, this, this is an example on the, the image on the bottom right, um, a competitor to OneWeb uh, known as Starlink. Uh, this actually retails on the market for just a snip under uh, $500, which for most users is, is going to be a tricky price point to adjust, adapt to. Um, so there's a definite downwards pressure in terms of uh, improving some of the, the cost savings uh, for this type of technology. Uh, and also with the more traditional uh, activities, um, there's this concept of high throughput satellites, which is using digitalization or digital payloads to use the resources of, of in-orbit spacecraft more effectively with, with um, such as this beam forming technology in the bottom left hand image. And lastly, uh, just to again mention um, the number of, of companies offering uh, satellite as a service, um, non-specialists who can who can identify the benefits that are available from, from space activities and, and involved, but don't want the complexity, complexity or the hassle involved in such activities. Um, so then just to uh, finish up by examining some of the um, main trends uh, in terms of resili resilience and security. Uh, following Brexit, um, the UK lost use of the secure signals from the uh, EU version of GPS. Uh, so instead, the UK um, has been exploring uh, options in terms of in terms of um, alternatives to that, um, which could potentially involve uh, the investment in the one web constellation. Um, 
well, the buildup of space debris within, particularly within low Earth orbit, uh, as you can see in the, the image uh, at the top, uh, also in other orbits, is uh, a threat to all satellites in space. But the UK has, in recent times, uh, looked to take some some leadership uh, in terms of addressing this this buildup of uh, debris, um, which is which is kind of the tragedy of the commons in that it's in everybody's best interest to to deal with all this debris. Um, and there's certainly opportunities to contribute to the sensors that are going to be needed to to track this debris, such as uh, laser ranging sensors, uh, and also in terms of actual missions into space to uh, try and get this debris. And then just to finish up, just to uh, mention that recently the UK uh, established its own space command, which is uh, the, our kind of military offshoot um, relating to space and uh, in some ways similar to the, the U, uh, US Space Force, which was established a few years back. Uh, so that was the uh, end of my slides. So I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. If there's any areas you'd like to, to investigate a bit further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And if you have got questions, which I'm sure you have, um, if you could just type them in the questions box and if Nick can't answer them right away, we'll get, endeavour to get those answered as soon as possible. Now, Nick, the Wi-Fi wasn't our best friend during that presentation, so there were a, a few um, glitches, but I hope most of you were able to to hear that. I think it's the wonders of technology in 2020, but that's why the, the space sector is so exciting because the potential that it can bring to all the things we do here on Earth. And, and a couple of points I want to, to pick up on. The first one is... We know there is huge potential in this commercial uh, space. Sure we've... Oh, hello. Nick, I think you've frozen. Can you hear me? Nick, can you hear me? I'm not sure if Siri is around and can uh, assist. Okay, well, I think what's best to do, why don't we try and come back to you, um, Nick? So we'll get Sue to um, speak to you and see if we can help this out and we'll follow up with questions afterwards. I think that's probably going to be the best thing. Um, if you can nod, hopefully you can hear me. And if we could um, now welcome to the stage Stuart and Sean from the National Composite Centre for their presentation. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, good afternoon all. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, let me know if we uh, need to tidy up the we're audio. Good. Might... We're good, I think it's the technology, Excellent. it's not you guys. Great, um, so uh, yes, I'll start us off with our first slide. So my name's Sean Cooper, I'm the Chief Engineer for Defence and Space at the UK's National Composite Centre. So a quick introduction to the NCC. Um, the National Composite Centre was founded in 2011 and is part of seven centres in the UK's high value manufacturing catapult network. We're a world leading authority on composites with over 300 engineering staff developing advanced composite materials processing technology to solve some of the world's most significant engineering challenges across uh, a number of different indu industrial sectors. We are an RTO focused on accelerating UK PLC to succeed with composites um, for the greater competitiveness of our companies in the UK against international competition. Yeah, so, so as Sean was saying there, that we're part of this high value man manufacturing catapult network. And the idea is that all of these different centers have different technology areas that they focus on. Uh, so obviously with us, it's composites. And we're here to support UK by working with whether it's, you know, uh, universities or startups or, you know, the big industry primes. We're here to take those really good ideas, take them from the lab, bring them through, mature them. Get them to get them to a point where they can actually benefit the the UK, uh, and and make sure that we're at the front stage when it comes to the technology that we're looking after. Um, so obviously here at the, at the National Commerce Centre, we have a dedicated defence and space team. Now you might ask, well, why defence and space? And to us, we kind of see those two things kind of being intrinsically linked, but maybe not right now, but definitely in the future. Um, and so we basically try to make ourselves a focal point for all those different types of organizations um, to support, you know, um, composites in the space domain. Um, we're also seen as a kind of go to research and technology organization 
uh, when it comes to putting together collaborative bids for, you know, European Space Agency um, bids or, or, you know, having that dialogue with the UK Space Agency. So composites are not new to the space sector. They've got a long history um, of use in major space programs over a number of decades, uh, but it's not necessarily been as widespread as we may see into the near future. Currently, we find that composites are used increasingly for launch vehicle structures and propulsion, with companies like Rocket Lab in New Zealand leading the global charge, really, for the adoption of composites for commercial launch. And composites are used in satellites as payload support structures, such as honeycomb cores bonded with aluminium and carbon composite face sheets, for example, and also high temperature applications, uh, such as re-entry, have been successful uh, in using polymer and ceramic matrix composites for heat shields, for example, as well. But although this precedent exists, there are seen to be new opportunities emerging year on year for advanced materials, including composites for space applications, of part of really a new emerging global race to commercialize the space domain. Yeah, so uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of what the status quo is and, and where composites are being used right now. But what we wanted to do today is kind of take you, uh, you know, forward into the future and show you, you know, where are we looking? Where do we see composites really taking off and where do we see that influencing how we use space in the space domain? So one of the big topics that we've um, been doing some research on and trying to understand the landscape and 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 figure things out in, in terms of the the science and everything is is in space manufacturing so we see that as being one of the really crucial areas um, of technology that the uk has a slight edge on and could actually really push us um, far into the lead ahead of other nations um, and also has implications for the defense domain which i will go into in a bit obviously rocket nozzles, you know, things like that, any part of the rocket engine that is, you know, high temperature needs those kind of um, ceramic uh, matrix composites types uh, of applications, uh, anything like that. Uh, lineless composite fuel tanks, which is another area. Um, I mean, recently this week, there's been a number of news articles with everyone claiming that they've just invented the first lineless composite fuel tank. Um, but there's all three of us all saying that at the same time. So clearly we're all heading in the, down the right track. Um, but obviously with us at the NTC, we've taken it a bit further and, and Sean will go into that in detail later on. Obviously, there's other implications for, you know, light weighting of materials when it comes to the future of, you know, nuclear propulsion and interplanetary exploration and, and so on. Um, um, so, yeah, the, these obviously kind of looking ahead, you know, of where we are today, but um, definitely the types of areas um, for where we think composites need to go. And those are the things we are looking at, working on and, and doing the science behind that right now. So to kind of focus back in on the in-space manufacturing, the, the reason why we see this as being in a very uh, important technology is just from a defense perspective, if you as a nation want to uh, control the space domain and, and have influence in that area and uh, be able to set up the infrastructure you need, you need to be able to build pot potentially really large structures. Now, if you want to build something as large as the International Space Station, you're going to have to be one of the big nations like, you know, the US or China or Russia, and you're going to have to have a pretty big launch vehicle, and you're going to have to build a lot of these modules separately and launch them up and then put them together. And it, it's um, it's not the ideal situation. And if you're a nation that doesn't have that kind of launch infrastructure, then you're kind of be, going to be you know, sitting on the outside of that circle. So you know, looking at your kind of typical launch vehicle, the thing that's going to kind of limit the the size of the structures you can send into space is going to be your launch vehicle and the payload capacity that you've got. Um, so I've, I found this lovely stamp over here, which shows, you know, the the, fusil, the, uh, the, the fairing kind of opening and showing you the, the payload inside. And that's effectively what you're playing with. But what if that wasn't a limiting fact. What if it didn't matter how big your rocket was? What if you could actually use a smaller rocket? Say if it was something like, I don't know, an Orbex Prime or a Rocket Lab, um, you know, Electron. <clears throat> you know, that could free things up for you. And the way you could do that is by creating a platform which uh, could manufacture the components for you and then assemble them so you could make much larger structures. Um, and the way we've been looking at that for composites is we think composites materials 
and combinations of materials are the way that you can achieve this in the most effective way that uses the least amount of materials um, can provide more superior performance in terms of durability and, and so on. And so we think hey, that'll be that'll be the future of how you build large scale structures in space. And the m ways you would do that you would have to involve, you know, potentially looking at you know uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, as most people refer to it, um, and, and trying to combine resins and fibers together in a way that allows you to build these components that are you know far superior to anything we could build on Earth and then send up. And if you just look at the 3D printing market, I mean, the, the size of these 3D printers is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking to the point where they can fit on your desk and just be a tiny little box. So in terms of being able to kind of try out this platform and and, and see if it works, the, the satellite we would have to work with to try this out could be something like an order of a 12U cube set. You could try and, and test out this manufacturing process with something that small. Um, and the implications of being able to figure that out as, as the UK would be huge for us because then we wouldn't need huge rockets to go and build this big infrastructure. We could take the lead on other nations and make sure that we um, um, have that expertise ahead of everyone else. Um, and then, you know, your imagination is, you know, is as big as you can take it. But if you if you can build a, you know, a decent size, you know, uh, manufacturing uh, satellite, that could potentially be resupplied with your resins and your fibers. You could then build these very complex structures, which aren't, you know, dictated by what you can build on Earth and what you can launch from Earth. It then means you can just, you know, go wild with with what you can create. And then you could also apply that to things like, you know, going to the surface of the moon and creating moon bases and all sorts of things like that. Um, and, and then potentially even using some of the material, you know, the the, the the constituents of the moon surface to go and find the materials you need to go and build those things. So we definitely see that as being the future of of building large structures in space. And and we want to make sure that the UK is in front of that uh, and you know is leading that science. Um, so sorry, was... sure, I, just, I was just going to say one more thing. Um, uh, it's just a side note. We we've also been doing some work with the University of Bristol to uh, develop these materials. And we've just recently um, been involved in some materials that are gonna be sent up to the International Space Station um, to be exposed to the environment and, to, and see how they react. And, and so all of that knowledge we're gathering is, is all gonna feed into this. So aside from the in-orbit manufacturing of composite materials that Stuart's covered just, just then, um, there's also opportunities in future com commercial launch of propulsion systems. I mean, development of new materials which have higher performance and re reliability than those available currently, manufactured to be lighter weight and lighter weight components all for lower cost are all opportunities. Um, polymer composites can be used for future compressed gas and cryogenic propellant storage at while well, the large scale for launches, for example, but also in smaller scale, even miniature tanks for satellite platforms, including nano cube satellites. And this is a technology area that we're developing across a number of uh, sector projects currently at the NCC. Uh, opportunities do exist for more polymer composite materials in support structures for propulsion systems, such as brackets and frames, um, and the use of things like topology optimization for composite structures with tailored composite design can offer further weight advantages as well. And also the development of new uh, low cost, ultra high temperature ceramic materials and novel and more efficient ways of manufacturing with those will help to increase the commercial viability or even competitiveness of uh, the UK and the UK companies in future launch. So one big area that we're looking into at the moment is propellant tanks. Um, there's a, a great opportunity here for composite materials in future propulsion. There's a lot of current UK research focused on developing weight efficient compressed and cryogenic storage options for say the hydrogen economy in both automotive and civil aerospace, but the potential for technology transfer in and out of those sectors and into the space sector and, and, and reverse um, uh, are huge. Um, for example, compressed inert gas um, or cryogenic uh, liquid oxygen or hydrogen st storage technologies for fuels, uh, quite an obvious technology transfer area there within, uh, within reach for the UK. There's a need for the development of conformal or non-spherical or cylindrical tanks that help with optimizing packing efficiency into payloads on, say, a standard satellite bus. And also the development of lighter and more durable tanks for launches could also provide us with great opportunities. Um, also, composite materials in this case could be cleverly used to help enable a design for demisability philosophy in future um, satellite 
um, operations, effectively helping to enable the deorbit and the burn up of redundant satellites at the end of their usable lifetime. A quick touch on nuclear propulsion in the future. I mean, this can provide um, more efficient thrust to travel farther and faster through space than has been possible before. It's an early development area, but um, things like operating on the dark side and with electrical and thrust systems or even lunar habitats in the shade of the sun, for example, become a possibility within uh, space nuclear technology. But for nu future nuclear power generation um, in space to be realized, there's significant materials and manufacturing challenges that need to be overcome. For example, materials that are in direct contact with, say, reactor fuels must be able to survive temperatures above, say, 2,500 degrees C, providing a great opportunity for the development of ultra-high temperature ceramic composites, for example, CMCs, and also other lightweight materials for extreme thermal and radiation environments. Um, there's opportunities for lightweight nuclear reactor supporting structures and frames that will ultimately be launched into, say, orbit or into deep space. And also, as previously mentioned, uh, again, another need for, say, lightweight propellant tanks for this uh, future propulsion system as well. So really starting to bring the presentation to a close. Um, in summary, uh, we've covered within this presentation a little on the emerging opportunities and challenges for materials and manufacturing as part of the new global space race. There's a, an opportunity for the development in areas of advanced materials, including composites that offer cost reduction and production rate increase for future space structures. Uh, composite engineering can be utilized uh, for optimized light weighting of future launch vehicles and payloads. Um, composites technology can realize the impossible with in-orbit manufacturing and assembly, as Stuart has covered, for extremely large structures where it may not have been possible before, um, or for those which perhaps are unable to be viably launched from the Earth's surface with, say, a, um, a, a launch vehicle. Uh, composites and advanced materials technology can be seen um, as necessary in supporting future space propulsion across a, a wide and diverse area, such as propellant tanks, as we've talked through, um, high storage efficiency, um, uh, fuel storage, also ultra high temperature ceramic components and composites for use in, say, the nuclear age in space, uh, which could be seen operating within, say, a decade. Um, it's really a very exciting time for advanced materials in space and currently the NCC's operational at China put itself and the UK um, at the forefront of being involved with all those new um, new materials developments. Thank you um, so much, Stuart and Sean. That was a, um, a genuinely really fascinating presentation. And as always, if you've got questions, if you can now type them in the questions box and I'll endeavor to get those answered as soon as possible. If they can't get answered, um, Sean, and Stuart, uh, Sean and Stuart's details are there and you can always, always email info at fluency.marketing as well. So one question I'm gonna ask before we um, go across to audience questions is, you answer or you offer a solution to a lot of the major problems we face in, in both downstream and upstream space exploration, both the, the hurdles of the cost of launch and how we can reduce that cost of launch, looking at in-space manufacturing and taking less payloads to space, and also the huge future challenge of, of going far in space. You talk about the potential for nuclear for space exploration and the role that composites can actually play in that because we're pretty much trapped in our solar system for humans to explore far. It's a huge problem. We're not very good at going fast relative to the, the vastness of space, but nuclear offers that potential. So there's a huge amount of stuff to, to come with the use of composites in, in terms of almost creating that science fiction like future. Stuart, you mentioned the thought of arriving at another planet, another world and, and manufacturing things from the land, much as what we did when we were exploring Earth. It, it sounds like science fiction, you know, new materials composites are enabling this to happen. How can we in the UK and in the UK's composite industry capitalize on this new potential when it is a completely new industry, yet it's solving so many hard problems in space exploration? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very uh, it's a very complicated uh, qu question and answer, but I, I think, um, like Sean was kind of alluding to there earlier, is like even though there's great ideas that we could apply into space and you know there's all these these modern technologies and, and things we're developing now there's also these all these offshoots that that benefit other areas of our life that we haven't even considered we won't even know about until we get there i mean uh if you look back at the apollo program there's things that were developed in there that you know accelerated our use of computers and and, and all that kind of thing so I, I can already see a few examples of where what we're doing now could be applied to other areas. And, you know, it, it, investment will need to come partly from government to kind of help seed these things and, and get, get the ball rolling. 
but soon you'll find industry will just pick it up and 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 go with it um i mean you could see like for instance the the, the fuel tank that um propellant tank idea that, that Sean's talking about, I mean, it has huge uh, applications in the net zero economy, you know, you know managing hydrogen transport and uh, and in the aviation industry and land transport. And um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, e even in, in orbit manufacturing where you're, you, you're going to have to develop this 3D printing mechanism, even that would be beneficial on Earth. So trying to figure out all of those, those challenges and issues will have huge benefits across the board. Um, but it will need to take a considered effort or the government will need to be convinced that this is the way to go. And, and, and it's, I guess it's our job to, to make that happen. And so, of course, there's, oh, sorry. Sorry, um, uh, just to jump in as well. I mean, uh, just to, another response to the question, I think really for the UK industry to really um, position themselves and to get a, a grip of this future in space technology world um, is all about collaboration, really. I mean, we look into the UK, we, we need materials companies and manufacturing companies with the end user and the launch provider and satellite manufacturers all working together in a collaborative space with the UK government support. And also with us say, uh, as a national Composite Centre on Composite Technology or other organisations and RTOs like us in the High Value Manufacturing Catapult Network are really there to help bring those collaborative arrangements together all, all in one place and really, you know, effectively working together against this challenge so we're better, stronger um, as a group um, and joined up. So, you know, we're, we're really keen to support organisations to get together across the entire supply chain to really capitalise on it. And that's really our role as, as, as a centre and also us as a, a catapult network. And if you look at the example of Apollo, we saw technology rapidly increase. Technology we likely would have already got, likely would have eventually got, but something which is accelerated because of the Apollo moon landings and the rush to develop new technology to land human beings on the moon. As we enter into this new space area and change, particularly in the US, you look at SpaceX, Blue Origin, um, Virgin Galactic, for example, change is happening much faster than people realise. But composites are key. To exploring beyond earth in so many sectors and so many aspects as you've mentioned in your talk but do you think we'll see a advance in composite technology material science technology just in the same way we, we saw with apollo yeah I, I absolutely i think we will and you know out of sector um so exploiting this technology development that's happening within the space sector and exporting it into other sectors is going to be really interesting to see as well i mean a couple of examples i talked about um, propellant tanks for say liquid oxygen or hydrogen storage i mean they've got definite um advantages in the growing net zero car uh, carbon economy in say automotive um, civil aerospace applications and energy storage systems as well. And I think those industries can work together because we sort of have similar challenges um, to, to, to get further quicker and to see those materials developments. And I also talked about nuclear propulsion as well. I mean, if you if you look at the requirement for things like radiation um, resistant materials, ultra high performance in terms of temperature to withstand those extreme temperatures I mentioned. I mean, technology transfer between the energy sector and say terrestrial nuclear um, generation or also potentially future fusion energy generation. There's a huge opportunity to capitalize on that sort of collective knowledge across multiple sectors. I mean, one thing the NCC does and, and the other HVM centers do as well is have multi-sector teams. I mean, myself and Stuart represent defense and space, but we work very closely with other sectors to map out the technology developments happening in those other sectors to see where the cross-sector benefits can be brought forward. So I think that's, um, it's something that we will see as part of this space development is all, all industry sectors benefiting from technology gains. Uh, and I'm just going to throw to um, a couple of the questions. Now, there's quite a few, so if you're able to um, answer some after uh, after this event, that would be great as well. But there's one from Nigel Lloyd-Jones. Uh, Lloyd he says, can you state which process and manufacturing equipment is used for the production of ceramic matrix composites, please? Yeah, it, there's a number of different ways to approach it. Um, it's uh, the use of raw materials, and then often um, you use a high, high temperature furnace to sinter the materials together. So the materials often start them, themselves with a polymer component, and then the polymer com component is removed by the um, application of extremely high temperature in a furnace. And then you can purge the furnace with different gases, so you can get different properties and, and different um, structure within the ceramic matrix composite that you um, that you can develop. We have a dedicated team at NCC. If you have more technical questions on on CMCs and the development of them, we're happy to relay them on to uh, to our specialist team in, in in the NCC as well. And sorry, were you going to chime in, Stuart, or do you want me to go ahead? 
No, no, I think I'll just add that, uh, you know, to, to go and take on these challenges of going into space, you're going to need smarter materials to get there and do those types of um, those jobs. So that's where composites come in. It's, it's not a, just about using a single material. It's about trying to combine the best of both different materials to get something far superior. I mean, that's the general idea behind composites. And then it segues on to the, the next question quite nicely. This is from Nilam. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, is there scope to replace aluminum with composite materials for rocket construction or is there no real need to do this? Well, it, it depends on the size of your launcher. I mean, obviously, we could see that um, as you start to go much bigger, you know, the kind of um, Elon Musk style, um, you know, rockets that he's building, you know, he's going for stainless steel and all sorts of things like that. But when you're looking at uh, the, the small sat launch vehicles, weight is a huge issue. And you really need to fight that battle, you know, daily to try and reduce the amount of weight you put on your launch vehicle. And the advances we've made in composites um, are, you know, especially with automation, have made, you know, made it possible to reduce the weight by like 30% from what you would have traditionally had. So it's definitely the key for the small sat and maybe medium-sized launch vehicles uh, like um, like uh, Fireflies Alpha or something like that. But um, but I think once you go bigger, then you start to you need to use you know, combination of different materials and, um, and depending on your propellants and so on. So yeah, it just it just depends on what you're trying to achieve. Okay, wonderful. Well, there's a few more questions in the chat box if you're able to answer them, but it's now um, just gone two o'clock, so that brings an end to this webinar. So, Stuart and Sean, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. So, um, many thanks to all of our speakers, Dave, Nick, Stuart and Sean. And if you have got any follow-up questions, particularly for Nick, because there's technical issues, you can email us at info at fluency.marketing. And remember, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question today, we'll do our very best to ensure that it gets answered via email over the coming days. So that's the, the final one of these Space AM webinars. I hope to see you next month at Space AM in person, which I'll be chairing. You can register at advancedmaterials.events, where you'll also find more information about Fluency Marketing's other Advanced Materials conferences. And if you'd like to watch today's presentation back or share the webinar with anyone, you're very welcome to do so. After this recording, you will receive an email with a link that you can share. So thank you very much for me and have a great day.